Additionally, in terms of physical development, as we've already alluded to, is puberty. So uh, puberty is comprised of a number of different events. Uh, first of all, secondary sexual characteristics developed. So for um, girls, that's the budding of nipples and breasts, uh, pubic hair growth, genitalia growth, and a first period. Now, it um, is commonly around age 12, but what we're seeing is that um, girls as young as 9 or 10 are sometimes getting their first period, and it's not uncommon for a girl to um, have de a delayed period until 14 or 15. For boys, secondary sex characteristics inclu include genital growth, again, pubic hair growth, and um, developing axillary, in other words, underarm hair and facial hair. And those two things could happen a little bit later. There's also changes in the endocrine system, which is responsible for our hormones that actually cause puberty. And um, the appearance of secondary sexual characteristics actually is caused by the um, uh, the turning on of the endocrine system and the hormones that are responsible for puberty. And finally, there's gender expression. So in um, gender expression, so gender expression is uh, loosely defined as the ways a person communicates their gender based on societal factors like gender norms and perceptions. So dress, carriage, um, things like that. We want to be aware that gender expression and gender identity are two different things, with gender identity being how a person sees themselves. It's their uh, own internal sense and personal experience of gender. And in the past probably uh, 10 years, there's been a lot of uh, work on um, these concepts as well as more of a fluidity of gender expression. So at this point in our history, um, we're not thinking of a binary male-female necessarily, but also um, a number of different kinds of gender identity. And we can definitely uh, get into that as we discuss this in class, if you'd like to. All right. Uh, the other um, piece of this is sexuality. So sexuality kind of bathes the entire adolescent in, in new and exciting and harrowing um, experiences and exploration. Uh, sexuality emerges in adolescence. Um, it's comprised of complex emotions. Um, so there's the physiological drive for sex, but there's also um, the desire for intimacy and romance potentially. Um, sexuality is defined as the state of being sexual, so physical acts, but also the more complicated um, parts, as I said, of emotion, um, drive to have sex, the considerations that are involved in sex, like birth control, the potential for pregnancy, sexually transmitted infections, things like that. And adolescents grow to understand their sexuality as they enter into romantic relationships for the first time. Um, alternately, some teens begin to understand their sexuality from purely physical connections with others um, without that budding uh, or simultaneous budding of emotion and uh, romance and relationship. All right. And finally, uh, nope, second to finally, we have uh, motor and motor performance skill. So you've seen this uptick of motor skill um, from birth all the way through middle childhood, and now it continues to be refined and become more sophisticated in adolescence. Um, there's a coordination and a calibration of movement that occurs. Females, uh, motor development happens till about 15. For males, it's into the early 20s, so we're going to see our young men continue to develop more and more con competence. And uh, we're going to see sophisticated 
fine motor abilities as well as gross motor with bilateral coordination being fully developed during adolescence. There's also um, some examples in the presenter notes of sophisticated fine motor. So it's things like taking notes, opening up very small containers, um, using keys, putting coins into machines. We have um, padlocks and um, combination locks in adolescence, etc. And then finally, finally, we have um, mental functions. So Memory is becoming ever more complex and specialized, and new types of memory are entering the scene, including semantic memory, which is a memory of a concept and memory of words. So if you think about it, it makes sense. High school is a time of really expanding academically, and so this idea of semantic memory very much supports that. Uh, Reasoning is also developing, And this involves metacognition and also higher order thinking skills, Um, but there's a lack of reasoning that's seen in adults. Um, So teens lack experience and they don't, if you'll remember, because of the striatal system, they don't have a really great idea of what is uh, risky and what is beneficial, their temporal sort of knowledge and integration is off. So they don't think far into the future or even a little ways. They think now and um, immediate gratification. And so uh, reasoning is not fully developed and it's also not the most um, mature or, um, or organized during adolescence. And finally, judgment, which I think I was just kind of covering. So the ability to make considered decision or come to sensible conclusions uh, is not particularly well developed yet, due again to the striatal system being sensitive and also a skewing of reasoning and, and, um, and temporal considerations. It's an exciting time but it's not a particularly calm and orderly time. Okay, activities and participation. So we have communication functions. Uh, Communication is happening in very sophisticated and mature ways in home, school, community, and also with play and and social or leisure time. There's verbal and nonverbal means of communication. For the teen, they're developing some very sophisticated ways of expressing themselves without without talking, um, with facial expression, with uh, proximity to others, with body posturing, etc. And they're engaging with potential partners, not only sexually, but uh, friendship-wise, romantically, intimately. And let's separate out that <clears throat> uh, that sexual intimacy, romantic intimacy, and friendship intimacy all occur, and they're not necessarily all with the same person, although they could be. And finally, social media, of course, um, puts a huge... Uh, huge burden and provides a huge opportunity for adolescents. Um, so it's a double-edged sword, uh, but it's, it's widely used and accepted as a method of communication. So we want to consider uh, virtual communication and social media as we think about teens. So we also have um, a little look at self-care and mobility. Uh, ADL skills are mastered. They're actually mostly mastered in middle childhood. Um, there's an interest in one's own attractiveness, uh, and that goes with the development of um, sexuality and moving through puberty and being very focused on a peer group. So it's my, it, it's the teen's attractiveness not only to potential sexual partners but also to their peer group. And uh, there's a a huge importance placed on appearance. We need only look to media to see the amount of marketing that is put out there for teens with um, what clothes to wear, what makeup, what hairstyles, what dances, what, 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 what. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, it it just totally uh, comes to the forefront. Um, And then finally, hygiene. So there's some new 
um, aspects of hygiene that come into the picture. Um, two examples are the use of deodorant because as we mature and um, our hormones kick in during puberty, um, the amount and the um, odor of sweat changes and uh, and it becomes more uh, inclusive of pheromones, right, which are then attractive to um, potential sexual partners, um, and also uh, menstrual management and upkeep. So uh, managing a cycle, everything from tracking cycles, managing cycles, um, changing tampons or pads, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, a bunch of kind of refinement and a couple new sorts of hygiene. I would say the other one is uh, that was not mentioned here is uh, shaving, both for um, males and females and non-binary folks. The other aspect is uh, mobility. So um, this has to do with uh, one's own personal mobility, whether walking, running in a wheelchair, what have you, but also, um, taking, um, transportation, learning how to drive happens in this period, getting a vehicle and adding that whole, um, kind of car maintenance to, uh, or skateboard maintenance or bicycle maintenance or motorcycle maintenance to our list of IADLs. So all of that is happening as well. All right, um, let's see. Next up, um, interpersonal interactions and domestic life. So in terms of interpersonal interactions, uh, we talked a little bit about identity formation in terms of gender identity. There's also sexual orientation. So who, uh, who is the, uh, the subject of one's sexual attraction? Um, and that can range very widely across the gender spectrum. And then also uh, ethnic identity so, uh, and cultural identity. So, you know, younger children are definitely aware of their race and their, um, and their cultural background. But in adolescence, it comes to the fore, it becomes a more important piece of who one is and ideas of self-identity. And there is also this idea of resilient coping. And this is important. Um, it means bouncing back to a previous state of normal functioning after events of adversity. So this is possible in adolescence, right? Um, typically a helpful adult can help an adolescent with resilient coping, but it becomes really important because the world gets so much bigger, the responsibilities, the roles, the habits, the independence, all of that is really expanding out, which is very wonderful, but it requires uh, a lot more coping due to the higher stress levels that are associated with it. And then finally, uh, domestic life. So the teen will have multiple occupational roles within their family and at home. Um, it may be a daughter, a sister, a um, step-sibling, a, a caregiver, and also um, this development of IADL responsibilities. Um, it could be that uh, they're still getting an allowance, not necessarily, and we see that it also moves into the work world in adolescence. Next up is relationships. So adolescents look for a reference group to form their behaviors and, and habits. And a reference group is a set of friends that serve as your source of information, your role models, and your audience to try out new behaviors. Uh, for example, trying out a new hairstyle. Is it cool? Do your friends like it? Um, what are they doing and how are they styling their hair? What products are they using? All of that sort of thing. And it's not limited to, um, to simply appearance, but um, it includes that and that's a nice example. Um, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, there's benefits and risks of social media. And um, hopefully we will hear more about that as we go through the, uh, the adolescent unit. Um, there's also family relationship and independence. So there's uh, 
four different types of independence. There's functional independence, which is the ability to, as it says, function without your parents, um, independence in, AA, in ADLs and IADLs. There's attitudinal independence, which is identifying one's values and beliefs, maybe the same, maybe different from your parents, and that may be uh, continue to develop into adulthood, but it starts in adolescence. Um, then there's emotional independence, which is uh, emotional supru- sorry, m- emotional support and approval. And now rather than looking to parents, we're looking at peer groups. Uh, teens may share their problems with their friends and their um, support group uh, of peers rather than with their family. And it usually continues to develop into adulthood. Then finally, there's conflictual independence. And this is acknowledging the differences that one has from their parents, um, free of negative emotions like guilt, bitterness, or resentments. Kids feel their parents um, like things that are out of style or not cool, but they don't make fun of them for it. Some do, some don't. Uh, Earlier in adolescence, kids may find their parents embarrassing, and then they find this conflictual independence, and so they can separate themselves and say, yes, my parents are like this, and I'm like this. Both things could be okay. Um, And finally, uh, with regard to relationships, there's romantic relationships, which can be emotional and or sexual. There's also family relationships. I'm not sure why that didn't get on here. I must have taken it off um, with, uh, you know, considerations like mealtime, travel, vacations, weekends versus weekdays, things like that. And I'm just going to take this opportunity to put it on there. Thanks for bearing with me. If I ever had a perfect, perfect, whoops, um, if I ever had a very perfect slide deck, it would that would be the day. All right, moving right along. Uh, then we have this kind of combo of a bunch of different occupations. There's education, and of course, uh, adolescents are expected to participate in formal education. Um, some in school, some not in school. There's also the education that revolves around academics versus the education that one experiences um, in hallways during extracurricular activities and events um, at lunchtime, etc. There's a routine that happens around school that's very important to develop. Um, things like transportation, when are extracurricular activities, doing homework. Um, And these things basically run an adolescent's life. You know, they take up so much time and energy that this is really a very big focus, whether one is in school or being homeschooled. It's a huge focus of the adolescent's life and, um, and a huge aspect of their time during the day. With regard to work, uh, sometimes uh, this is the the typical time of getting your first job. Um, Vocational choice is influenced by um, various realities like the the constraints of the job, um, the individual skills, what sort of education is necessary for the job opportunity, emotional appeal, um, like, you know, I love working with animals, so I'm going to do that. Um, an individual's value, et cetera. So this is the time where like, you know, figuring out like who you are in relationship to work really just starts happening. And then finally, leisure time. So it's based on context and what's available to the teen. And uh, sports participation really for a lot of uh, young people comes to the forefront. I would say also that um, uh, clubs and, um, and, and common interests that particular individuals really want to pursue is another area where we see, um, where we see a lot of development and, and time and energy put, um, you're interested in music, you're in the band, you're interested in drama, you're doing plays, things like that. So new section, health and impairment. 
First, we're going to look at uh, a bunch of adolescent health issues. Uh, first and foremost, um, there are environmental factors that uh, affect teens, um, and they um, can affect how healthy that person is. Um, everything from where they're living, how much money is in the family, to what they're eating, um, what's available in terms of role models, all sorts of things like that. We see often the onset of eating disorders during adolescence, sometimes in middle childhood, but most often in adolescence, both um, because of this blossoming of the need to be attractive and be socially accepted by others and also the onset of puberty. And we also see um, substance abuse and alcoholism start in adolescence. Um, and finally, um, depression and anxiety are also issues that affect teens. 28% uh, of adolescents um, report being depressed. I would imagine um, during COVID that number is much, much higher, both in terms of um, depression and anxiety. And then we have um, a range of other health issues like se sexually transmitted infections and diseases, unplanned pregnancy, and obesity, which um, fits loosely into the eating disorder category. Um, typically with eating disorders, we think about bulimia or anorexia or binge eating disorder, but um, obesity definitely figures in there as well. So in summary, uh, there are physical changes in adolescence. There's brain maturation, uh, development and sleep, puberty and sexuality, and motor and mental functions, and do um, review those. Then there's activities and participation, uh, ADLs and IADLs, relationships with a range of different people in different ways, school and work, and leisure time. And then finally, we talked about social and health considerations. So as you um, review this slide deck, please consider what questions you have, jot them down so you don't forget them, and bring them to class. I will be happy to discuss uh, any or all of this, um, to dig deeper into any topics, and to continue our learning about uh, the age and stage of adolescence when we meet. Here's some references for you. And that concludes our lecture on adolescence. I thank you for your time and attention, and I will see you in class. Take care, everyone. Thanks.